Welcome to Potato Related Issues. It's a podcast where we talk about the most interesting stories from Irish history. This week, we're discussing the Siege of Jadoville. My name is Killian Doyle, and this week I'm joined by Nikki Casey, Alna Dineen, Luke Barr, and Seamus Dwyer. If you have any questions, feedback, or suggestions for future episodes, you can email us at potatorelatedissues at gmail.com. You can send us a tweet at Potato Related Issues on Twitter, or you can check out our Instagram, also Potato Related Issues. Do you think of a good name for a podcast? No. Yeah, yeah, right now. That's a pretty, <laughs> that's a pretty good like, name. This is final, so don't mess it up. Welcome to the now podcast, guys. Because we're in the now, except we're talking about something that happened 50 years we're ago. We're in the now, and we're not in the know about the topics. <laughs> yeah. I've got a comprehensive knowledge of reeling in the ears. <laughs> <laughs> reeling in the ears It's reeling great. in the ears taken bram, bram, as a bram, 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 bram. Luke, hit it. <laughs> <laughs> It's me, Mr. Reel in the Years. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> it's Gemma, our first ever guest. When the text comes up, you're the person. The yeah, yeah, yeah. Do they still make it? Yeah. It still comes out. Uh, well, they Should ran, we they they ran out of years. Have they not reeled in all the years? <laughs> they have. They did the 2000s there recently, wow. so they, they got to wait for the next decade to roll around before they do the next one. So uh, we're talking about the Siege of Shadowville <laughs> and the Battle that. for the Tunnel, which were two events both involving Irish Defence Force troops that happened during the secession of Katanga incident in former Belgian Congo in Central Africa. Before we get into it, does anyone know anyone in the Defence Forces? My uncle is in the Air Corps and he works in the airbase that they flew out of to really? go to the Congo. Nice. Kind of like a side point, but I used to play... Uh, airsoft a good bit and you'd have these people who are clearly not good enough to get in the armed forces like they're way too overweight and slow <laughs> and they think that they're the hardest men and they'd have like they'd have buy like thousands of euro worth of equipment that'd be on like the b team reserves or something <laughs> like the worst of the worst <laughs> And he does airsoft, not actual army. Yeah, these people, yeah. Yeah, like, they, 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 don't, they don't go into the real army. They go into right. the forest and pretend that they're in the army. Oh, I see. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. Well, I don't know. You know, interestingly, actually, the camo for the Irish army is illegal for anyone else to wear. Why is that? Um, because it's owned by the, uh, the, by the Minister for Defence. People get really anal. I've heard a few stories of people wearing uh, like army Irish army jackets on the street right. and people coming over to them and being like, fucking take that off or I'm calling the guards. Really? And they're like, what? Like, the camouflage pattern is illegal. Um, and I heard, like, people on boards, like, oh, my dad gave me his army jacket. What can I do? And people are like, you can't wear it. Like, you'll get in shit. That's insane. Yeah, I know. It's really weird. People oh. can walk around in the States in, like, army gear, right? Yeah, but that's a problem in itself. I think a lot of people, uh, because, like, you get discounts and stuff if you're an army vet in America. So a lot of guys do dress up right. and they'll get those discounts. But, like, a lot of people do get called out on it. They have, like, a bit of an issue there. I'm not sure tents. if it's illegal in, in the U.S., but it's definitely illegal here to wear. It's the it's the camouflage pattern, anything with the pattern. So, I feel like, like it's just... Even if I'm wearing, like, little tight it... shorty shorts with the Irish Army pattern, <laughs> even though it might not have anything Ireland on it, like, the like, Minister uh, of Defence is going like, to come and um, take them off me. The, the, the cashier... The cashier <laughs> maybe I want them to. The cashier to see is the top of your underwear poking up above your jeans, and they're like, hey, soldier. You're going to have to take those off. <laughs> So, like, what's this pattern like? I'm, I'm uh, I don't know. Describe it to us. It kind of looks a bit like camouflage. Yeah. I, I can't see it. Nobody's so ever it seen it. I mean, there's been someone in the room wearing it the whole time. <laughs> I'm getting a lot of this stuff from a TG Carter documentary. If anyone is listening to this, it's not from Ireland, which no one's listening to this, other than myself. <laughs> <I edited. laughs> no one listens to this. Well, if someone was, so they technically they're not from Ireland. TG Carter is our Irish language state broadcaster, right? So everything they put out is in the Irish language. The actual interviews with the veterans were, were in English, so you can easily watch it under subtitles for the Irish parts. It's all on YouTube. Probably throw a link in wherever I put this up. But the documentary is called uh, <laughs> Congo on Vlian Mila Negeid Shaska Hain Shai Duri Shiakana, which is Congo 1961 peacekeeping soldiers. So they interview people from the 35th and 36th Irish Defence Force Battalions who were involved in both of these incidents I'm going to talk about. And I also watched the siege of jadoville it's a a netflix original film it it stars jamie dornan and it's directed by richie smith how many people have seen 50 shades of gray i've only seen the first one yes baby no do you think jamie dornan is sexier with a mustache and a Kerry accent than he was in that movie because i'm going with a resounding yes Mm. i don't know (laughs) all right i've got a bit of background here on the secession of katanga session with a c secession like secession s-e-c-e-s-s not just a big old session session it was a big old session all the irish lads showed up but um, secession. But they never covered the siege of Jadoville or this 
battle for the tunnel in our leaving cert, even though that seems pretty important. Like it's the only time Irish troops have been in combat situations on do, foreign soil. Do you uh, do you have notes on the Irish soldiers that were killed? a few years before this are they the ones that were involved in that ambush yeah i do have that yeah okay i'll get to that cool yeah all right this whole situation is really really complicated it's really not enough to cover in an hour-long podcast like, there's so many there was like um I- i'll get into it. nooks <laughs> so, and crannies it's nooks pretty much the americans and the russians wanted the vibranium <laughs> they wanted the vibranium <laughs> what was the name of the actual actual name of it uranium no the actual place jadoville no the Chichanga. province Katanga. Katanga, yeah. It yeah, sounds yeah. a lot like Wakanda. And they do have rare metal that yeah. people want. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Coltan, right? Um, they had uranium as well. All right, well, I'll, I'll get into it here. So um, the Congo... ignoring me. No, I'm not ignoring you. I'm, this is the first thing... <laughs> you don't have anything good to say. I just said Colton. Yeah. It's cobalt and copper and gold and uranium. That was and kind the of their main And is what goes into goddamn phones. The what is? Colton. They were already fruit- mass producing Colton. phones it's in the nineteen sixties, were they? I don't know if it's mined in Congo though. And were they producing mobile phones in the nineteen sixties? Oh no, but, the but they knew. You little bitch. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> um, so we need to evade the Congo to get their mobile phone. Te- I mean, uh, <laughs> I mean to save the pe- the good people of the Congo. Um, so look, the Congo. It was under Belgian colonization since nineteen. Don't hit me. When it was known as Belgian Congo. But it gained its independence from Belgium on the 30th of June 1960 and became known as the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is what it's still known as today. Immediately after the Congo gained independence from Belgium, and I think within like a month or less, the Confédération des Associations Tribu, Tribu, uh, known as CONICAT, uh, they were a political party uh, in the Congo supported by various European countries. They attempted to secede from the Congo. But they were stopped by Belgium, uh, who preferred that the whole region of Katanga should secede together as a unified state. Goddamn Belgians. Uh, when the Belgians Congo, have good beer. Sorry. They do have good beer. So when Congo gained independence, they were under the control of Prime Minister Patrice Lumumba, who was friendly with the Soviet Union. And this is during the Cold War. Congo had uranium mines. And actually, um, one of those uranium mines was the ones that the US got the uranium that they used to develop the bombs that they dropped on Hiroshima. Uh, the one that they dropped on Nagasaki was a plutonium bomb, so they only used uranium for this. Other one. Congo, its main export came from the region of Katanga it's down people. the. Sorry. <laughs> besides, <laughs> like a good slavery it's joke. We're talking about the Congo. It's people, <laughs> allegedly, not allegedly, the Belgians did some serious looking slave oh, trade. They chopped off a lot of hands in the in yeah. the Congo. Yeah, yeah. really. There's, there's accounts of like parents chopping off the limbs of their kids because their kids had a better life. Because that, that disqualified them from working for the Belgians. Yeah. So you, they would rather have the kid have no limbs or have no arm than um, work for the Belgians. Because yeah. I really, I just it was spent, so horrible. I just briefly mentioned Belgian colonization and get straight into this secession, but I should have probably done a few paragraphs on Belgian colonization because it was really fucked up. Like from what little I read about it over the last couple of days, like it's all about those rubber farms. Is it really? Like the rubber, rubber farms. Tr- rubber was really, really valuable, and that's where all the trees were. Yeah, Belgium, you should be ashamed of yourself, frankly. But um, you have great beer. You have great beer. They have waffles. Mm, Their waffles, waffles are good too, but your slavery is not good. Anyway, back onto this secession oh, from slavery. Great rubber as well. <laughs> um, oh, God. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so um, well, we're going to get fucking attacked yeah. um, by, by the Belgians. They're too nice to attack us. Uh, the region of Katanga was the primary export of all these minerals, so they produced... Copper, cobalt, gold, and uranium from their mines. And what was that? What else did they produce? Oh. And Colton. Colton. <laughs> what is Colton? I've never heard Colton of Colton. Colton is the metal that they use in phones. And that's why it's so hard to recycle. I thought it was gold. Oh, I definitely thought, I thought it was gold, it was the gold, gold well. for all the connections and shit. I don't know. I had to do a um, project on it in secretary school. What did you use the Colton for? Is it in the batteries? Huh? I, I actually don't know. I can't remember. I was in like fifth year of secondary school. That's a long time ago. I'm trying to th- and then they reclaimed the magical beans from your <laughs> mobile phone. <laughs> Fact check me, you sons of bitches. <laughs> Do I have beans on my phone? Yes or no? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Talking About Colton, the Colton based podcast. <laughs> <laughs> All right, today's topic is Does Colton exist and what is it used for? 
<laughs> and the sideline, magical beans. <laughs> yeah, your name. Yeah, Always it's used yeah. for manufacturing capacitors. Fuck. There you go. Comes. Magical beans. <laughs> <laughs> God damn. Yeah, why not? The region of Katanga in the south of the Congo, which was like the richest region in the Congo. They didn't want to be involved with the Soviets. And that was like a major point from this guy. Chombe. Chombe. Or <laughs> Chombe or Sean Bay. It's like T S H O M B E, but it's Chombe. I think it's Chombe, right? Chombe. Chombe. If you put it's a T a in front of it. Chombe <laughs> declared that Lumumba was under the control of the communists and declared the state of Katanga as a separate state from the Congo. Belgian troops in the Congo's army left and joined forces with the Katangese army, right? And Lumumba requested support from the UN. Now, um. The US was fucking gagging to get in on this, right? The UN is sort of trying to keep the US to more of a supporting role. They don't want them to be on the ground because when this America... It's pre-Vietnam, right? 60s? Pre-Vietnam, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so how, did, how did the UN do that? I mean, look at the Korean War, right? That was really the UN... Or technically, it was the UN, but it was maybe, really the American... Maybe it was because of the UN or the right. Korean War that they were, you know... Have to take a step oh, back. They, like, yeah. they, f- they fucked up so badly in Korea. It's like, yeah. we maybe better not the UN mess up was the like, Congo just as bad. We don't want it. Because it's a very similar type of situation you got. There's a communist supported North and the anti-communist South who's trying to secede away from the North. And right, yeah. Yeah, so it's very similar Ew, type of thing going on. Don't mo- don't, I don't know much about UN politics. But Neither do I. It's very yeah, complicated. It makes sense. I mean, the Korean War... But it's pretty common sense. Yeah. They're yeah. only 20 years out of a... World, world war, war at this yeah, stage yeah yeah i so mean it's fresh world war one's world war two it's yeah. like the same kind of deal anyway go on so um lumumba's requested support from the un the Chambay's forces Just consist of track katangi's gendarmes under the command of belgian officers who've come over from the congo's armed forces you also have british rhodesian french and south african mercenaries the united nations sets up the, U- the united nations in the congo or onuc o-n-u-c lumumba is eventually overthrown in a coup d'etat by Joseph Mobutu, and he's sent to Elizabethville, which is in Katanga. He's sent to Elizabethville on the 17th of January, 1961, where he's tortured and executed. And that's where the movie The Siege of Jadoville starts. And that reminded me a lot of the start of um, Call of Duty 4, where he's like in the car getting driven along. And he gets like dragged out of the car and brought into a yeah, place yeah. and shot in the head. It's like, and he, it's even a POV shot of the gun pointing at the camera. Killian, he's jiggling my mic Stop on purpose. Stop jiggling the microphone, please. <laughs> I have to edit this. So every time you jiggle, just imagine that I need to <laughs> cut out that segment and mute it. That's I another one. Sta- I told him this last time. He keeps jiggling. He's a big fidgeter. He is. All right. So look, um, <laughs> the operations in Congo, the Onuk guys, uh, initiate Operation Rum Punch. On the 28th of August, 1961. One punch. Rum punch. One punch! <laughs> <laughs> I, I watched One Punch Man. It's actually not bad. I'm going to punch myself in the face. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Rum Punch. 28th of August, 1961. pro Katangi's mercenaries are captured. I think they got like 70 odd of them. In retaliation, Tashambe brings in many more mercenaries to boost his numbers. And they eventually release those guys that they captured during Rum Punch. And they just come back over to Katanga to rejoin Tashambe's men anyway. So it's completely right. pointless. And then after that, Operation Morthor was put into effect. And this is a massive like attack on Elizabethville by the UN forces that begins on the 13th of September, 1961. So we're talking full aggression by the UN. No peacekeeping involved. Like they go in guns wow. blazing, and they take the city. Operation... That's why? Why did they do that? They usually don't go on the d- offensive. This UN army that goes and attacks Elizabethville, who's it made up of? Um, Swedish... Indian and Irish forces as the well. The Irish me. take part in an attack yeah, on Elizabeth. I'll, I'll get to that. Yeah, yeah. Post the assassination of your man. Literally four days before. Uh, on the 17th of September 1961, the UN Secretary General Dag Hammarskjöld, uh, his plane crashes while on the way to Rhodesia to negotiate peace talks between Tashambe and the Congolese government. Fake and news, you were shot down. It's still unknown. But I thought they came out and said they, they were shot down. There was Recently. Controversial? There was a report released, like fairly recently i think like 2000s that said that he, they'd found evidence that he was shot down by a jet yeah but um i thought there was something even more recent like in the last year really that said he was shot down oh shit fact, fact check. check you know in the movie, the movie? Th- in the movie the, the siege of shadowville there's no two ways about it they literally show a fighter jet close in <laughs> on his plane and they're like beep, 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 we're detecting like an enemy plane and he gets shot down whereas in real life at least until the last year, from what Luke's saying, it, it was really unknown, but it was strongly suspected that he was shot down. So Thomas. the original news was that the plane had crashed. Yeah, but right. it was always under un- suspicious, suspicious circumstances. circumstances at best. 
So in 2015, they had a new uh, report which says it was definitely plausible that he was shot down. Um, so they got Adam and Jamie from the posters, but involved? they were like, yeah, that could have happened. The motive is there. The motive is definitely there. Sean Bay doesn't want to rejoin the Congo. He wants to stay separated. He, wants he to got mines, baby. Yeah, he's got mines. And Belgium doesn't want the secession to end either. They're fully behind Katanga here. I have a bit of brief background on this dude, Connor Cruz O'Brien. He's basically Hammerskull's representative on the ground in the Congo. And he's from Dublin. He was born in 1917 in Dublin. Where? He, uh, Rath Mines. Oh, I shit. Think. Yeah, his nickname was... Fancy boy. His nickname was The Cruiser oh, when oh, he lived wow. in Dublin. He's featured prominently in the movie The Siege of Jadoville as, like, the main antagonist. So, like, when I was watching the movie, I thought that they were really over... They shitting on him. Yeah, really shitting on him. Like, uh, um, he seems like a straight up villain you know he seems like really inept really inept he's like a career politician making all these bad calls and mm-hmm. defending and covering up his mistakes and stuff to he's kind of using them as career. a scapegoat every time they're calling for relief and stuff he's in the background like who are you talking to there is that those guys in that siege they're not getting any supplies fuck them like he's they're really pushing that this guy's an asshole mm. in the documentary he wasn't mentioned and in all the stuff about the siege of Jadoville, he wasn't mentioned but when i actually looked him up specifically all this shit came out about him that i thought he needed an entire page to himself oh after god all. Wow. So, um, how many pages have you gotten through so far uh one. Oh god so um <laughs> so he was heavily involved during the uh, operations in in katanga but uh he really downplayed his involvement in his book to katanga and back which he published i think two years after it ended it's kind of hard to underplay your involvement and publish a book called Duke Katanga and Back. <laughs> this guy, <laughs> while downplaying your involvement the, this in guy, Katanga. He mightn't be the brightest guy. The book, The Siege of Jadoville, that the movie's based off, it doesn't use Tu Katanga and Back as its source, but instead uses direct UN records of his correspondence while he was in the Congo. And that sort of sheds a much more accurate light on what he was really like than what his own book does, surprisingly. Now, Operation Morthor, Mordor, while it eventually did sort of lead towards katanga's surrender the un lost a fair few people and it wasn't quite as clean cut but he's basically like oh i had no involvement in operation morthor but he leaves out in his book this meeting he has with senior un officials in which he straight up authorizes them to go ahead with operation morthor and that scene is in the film as well what actually was the objective of operation morthor and basically just take back the city of elizabethville from the katangese forces and their mercenaries they were like we need these guys out of the country. Use violence if necessary. But we're like, why violence. was this they, Yeah, so... we're using violence. We're getting these guys out of the country. But why was it so important? Because, like, usually the UN... Sweeping statement here, but usually mm. the UN, like, use of violence is, like, like, 100% last resort. But it seems like for something that didn't seem that violent to begin with, it seems like they went in hard very quickly. There was like a big lack of communication kind of between upper level UN officials mm. and the, the guys on the ground commanding peacekeepers. I don't know, some people on the ground must have just really wanted to get some action in. Like well, yeah. this guy, um, O'Brien especially, went over to the Congo kind of expecting there to be lots of bloodshed. And that comes mm. across in his correspondence here. Probably... Checking maybe there's a bit of the, the climate, like the world climate at the time, you know, height of the Cold War. Yeah. Maybe it would have played into it a bit. So uh, I have some quotes here from Mr. O'Brien. Uh, this one's to to Dag Hammerskold. It says, Fate may bring you to the Congo while I am here. In that case, we will have a party and eat some Belgians. What? So um, he's, this is kind of before shit kicked off. So he's kind of expressing the fact that he's expecting a shit bit of to battling to happen yeah. here. No, he's just saying he's going to eat, eat some Belgians. Some Waffles? Belgians. <laughs> Belg- it could have yeah, been. They, 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 it got cut off. Waffles is tasty. This one's to his UC... Waffles are tasty. <laughs> they are, they go- um, all- Quality content. Uh, all <laughs> waffle checkup. <laughs> Welcome I to Wafflecast. <laughs> this week, Belgian waffles. <laughs> we just, <laughs> week, we'll find a different type of waffle. I we wish. just talk absolute waffle. <laughs> waffle on. That'll be the name of the podcast. My mom makes great waffles. My mom makes great Belgians. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so all these quotes are from this one Irish Independent article that's basically a hit piece on O'Brien. This is where I got most of this bad mm-hmm. shit about him. This next one is, it just says, to a UCD friend, Professor Patrick Lynch, an entirely new perspective on world politics and plenty of powers gin. I can offer you a room, food, drink, and approximately 3 million acres of rough shooting. Jesus Christ. 
And then this next one. Now, this either happened, I think it happened during Operation Rum Punch, which was meant to be the successful one. They, they were basically like, oh, we captured all these mercenaries without any casualties. But um, the two targets were a post office and a radio station. This event is called the Radio Katanga Massacre. And it's brought up in the movie. And it's brought up briefly in like a couple of articles I read. But they never say during what operation it was. Because Operation Mortar was the really violent, fucked up one. And Operation Rum Punch was the really successful, non-violent sort of one. But I think this happened during Rum Punch. Basically what happened was a, a detachment of Indian UN peacekeepers were sent to get mercenaries out of this place, Radio Katanga. And they ended up just killing everyone inside civilians and all like a shitload of civilians and in the movie th- 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 like uh, this guy o'brien is talking to the head of that indian de- detachment and he's like how did all these civilians die and he's like oh they barricaded themselves inside and we couldn't get in so we just threw grenades through the windows yeah. and then he's like but when they started to climb out the windows and you saw that they hadn't got any guns and he was like oh we couldn't take the chance we just had to shoot them on the spot kind of thing yeah so um and that's <laughs> not and then comically this is why i thought that they were really mm. overplaying his evilness in the movie because he's like no one hears about this. I don't want any word yeah. about this in our UN reports, okay? He just struts around yeah, being like... Yeah, being a comical cartoon don't villain. Don't fucking open your mouth, but, bitch. Um, when asked about the Radio Katanga massacre, he said, any troops in the world are likely to get touchy under these circumstances. <laughs> so um, you got a building full of unarmed civilians and they're armed with machine guns and hand grenades. Anyone's going to get touchy. It's like in that Kavanaugh case where the guy's just like, oh, well, if, if Bre- Brett Kavanaugh can be done in for... <laughs> for um, assault then all guys can get, get done in for assault no like, only the ones who've assaulted people that's how that works <laughs> like you're under arrest <laughs> we've all assaulted people right guys uh oh <laughs> <Go. laughs> that's kind of all the stuff about O'Brien specifically that's related to this event but I wanted to uh, really hammer home how much of a dickhead this guy was in 1965 he went to South Africa to personally oppose the African National Congress's boycott of apartheid so he felt so strongly in favor of apartheid that he went and protested against the protest against apartheid. What a piece wow. of shit. In 1969, he was elected as a Labour TD to the Dáil. Those are our ministers, basically, uh, to our... Parliament, MP- MPs. MPs, in Britain. members of Parliament. It would be our Parliament. Congressmen yeah. in yeah, the yeah. US. He served in the Fine Gael Labour Coalition under Liam Cosgrave from 1973 to 1977, which we cover in our IRA Prison Escapes episode which doesn't exist. <laughs> um, <laughs> he enforced censorship of RTE while in office and banned Sinn Féin spokespersons from appearing on any RTE shows. <laughs> he says I can have a wagon. <laughs> he supported Gardaí brutality during the Troubles and when a guard personally told him of a time he beat the shit out of a suspect for information, O'Brien recalled in his memoir years later, so he published this, I refrained from telling this story to Gareth Fitzgerald or Justin Keating, who are other ministers, it says here. Gareth Fitzgerald was the Taoiseach of Ireland at one point. Really? Yeah. Oh, dear. Um, uh, the Fine Gael leader for a decade. Oh, boy. didn't even need his phone for that one. That was pretty good. That was quick. Reading so, in the ears, um, guys. So, so this <laughs> <laughs> is... So, um, <laughs> so, I did not have sexual relations with this woman. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> I am not a <laughs> Um. So, so this guard, a guard of our police. <laughs> um. Has, <laughs> has told <laughs> he, he told O'Brien at the time, and this is a quote that he beat the shit out of this guy until he'd talk. He said, "I refrained from telling the story to Gareth Fitzgerald or Justin Keating because I thought it would worry them." It didn't worry me. It's just a bit of a scumbag. He um now he's been in Fine Gael this whole time, right? So here's a bit of a curveball. He joined the United Kingdom Unionist Party in 1996. <laughs> wow! So this guy literally ticks every box. He hates apartheid. He supports the censorship, censorship. No, he doesn't hate apartheid. He, he no, he supports, loves apartheid. Yeah. He supports police brutality and censorship of public broadcasters. And he joined the Unionists in 1996. Just but he's a Dubliner. He's a Dubliner. He joined the Unionists because yeah, he's, he went so, to UCD. he's so anti-IRA. <laughs> he hated republicanism and thought that the Troubles was getting a bit out of hand, which is understandable. But joining the Unionists is like the exact opposite of that. Like in, 1996, in 1996? Just before the Good Friday Agreement. <laughs> uh, I think he... 
he wasn't a big fan of the Good Friday Agreement. I doubt he was. Oh. Yeah, he wrote articles against the Good Friday Agreement and stuff. Oh, he was sued by relatives of those killed during the Bloody Sunday attack in 1997 for alleging that the marchers were Sinn Féin activists operating for the IRA. Oh, this guy's <laughs> a piece of shit. Um, he died in December 2008. And not a moment too soon, in my opinion. He should have died <laughs> before... The Katangan secession, in my opinion. What a piece, piece of shit. Of shit. Like, I thought in the movie, I was like, no way is this guy such a piece of shit. He's a bigger piece of shit than they portrayed him in the movie. Yeah. In the movie just kind of seemed like went inept easy and cowardly. He went easy on him. That's what he looks yeah, like. He seemed like he's covering hey, his arse. Here, yeah. uh, Richie Smith, you should have made O'Brien a bigger cunt in your movie. All right? Yeah, just him like slapping yeah, just, puppies or just, something. Yeah, just something oh, like no. that. Just, just like... <laughs> <laughs> so I come here on to initial Irish involvement in the Congo. The Irish sense of the Congo were... They were very underprepared. Um, when boarding the American troop transports, what was that airfield, Mickey? You were saying Bad Donnell. Bad Donnell was the airfield. Yeah. And who did you know who was there? My uncle. He works there. there. Cool. Works there. Nice. Currently. And whereabouts is that? Um, Southwest it, Dublin. It's in Bad Donnell. Uh, <laughs> nice. Won't need a fact check on that. I believe you. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so um, they're board, there maybe. I'm not sure. They're boarding these American planes, and they're, they're with American peacekeepers as well. And they're carrying their rations, which consisted mainly of sandwiches in plastic bags. Oh, nice. Was it prepared by their mammies? Yeah, they're basically carrying school lunches onto the planes with them, like homemade sandwiches in plastic bags. That's Did their the rations. the crust get cut off? The crusts were oh. cut off. I can, I can, gar- I can tell you now. Cute. It's confirmed. <laughs> was it in the movie? Was the mammy the was fussing over the, the soldier? Yeah, was like, and, like, and, Did you bring your coat? I'm going to the feckin' equator. Goes, yeah, well, you better watch um, your feckin' language at the equator. <laughs> See, he says that, but they were wearing, like, wool pullovers yeah and they, they were, were going to africa yeah was well, that so, that's the thing in the tg car as well yeah, they, yeah, saying, that's they didn't have a clue where they were going yeah, it was like we don't know families. if it was going to be fucking desert or jungle they didn't know what or bush city whatever they it was didn't know anything like they're, they're did family. they know they were going to the congo yeah but they didn't know what the congo was they didn't know what kind like. of environment it was like it's at like all. a really shitty like one of those like mystery tour yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> which war zone are you going to today they were saying that their wives were asking where they were going to end up and they were like i can't tell you i don't know like I've no idea. So they're wearing wool jumpers going to Africa, oh. basically. I remember seeing pictures With of sandwiches. guys in the SAS, like in the desert, just sunburned to shit. Yeah. Like yeah. holding like these are remote outposts in the desert. And I was like, oh. but there's a quote in the documentary from one guy. He said that when the doors of the plane opened, he thought that like he was feeling the blowback from a jet engine of the plane next to him when he stepped outside, but that it was just the air. Oh man, it's actually really funny as well because these guys. A lot of them probably had never been outside of like Ireland, or yeah. at least anywhere near that climate. Well, some like, of them were only happen? like fucking yeah. nineteen. Yeah, but you know, what? We're, we've kind of all experiences going to hot climates because we're you know, because we're fancy bitches. We're boozy. We're fucking twenty first century people. <laughs> but like them, first they're probably gone outside of Ireland. It's like England, maybe. My friend knows a guy who's never left Dublin. He's Irish. Like, what the fuck? Mental. Yeah, I know it's crazy. The Irish peacekeepers received. All their medical checkups and some as many as 10 inoculations on the day of their departure. Is that just a vaccine? This is a vaccine for like, you know, they, they got them before they, just before they the left. day of the departure. They, they would have been useless. Like, yeah, useless. they would have literally been useless. This this first, uh, I don't know what Italian these guys were a member of. I think it was like the 34th. These were those guys we were talking about who some of them were killed before the main shit kicked off. So oh, actually, yeah, I know nothing about this. They didn't like, really touch on that movie, like did they? Northern Katanga, which is near this region called Wakanda, Kasai, and it is the Luba tribe or the people of Luba, which were known as Balubas. And these guys, are you're actually, a Baluba. Um, these guys are actually against the Katanganese secessionists, right? So these guys are pro Congo. They are and they aren't. Like it's very. Even within the Congo, the part that wanted to remain together, there were still tribal conflicts and stuff. There was like three different regions of the north that were all slightly hostile towards each that's other. That's colonialism. There, yeah, that's what happens. Da, 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 but, da, da, da. Um, so the region that these Irish guys are in is filled with Balubas. But um, the Irish were really friendly with the Balubas and there was never any open hostility between them at the beginning. One of the guys in this documentary was saying that like they'd come across a destroyed bridge and the Irish guys would just fix it, and then they'd come back a few days later, and the Balubas would have destroyed it again, so the Irish would fix it again. But they'd never be in, like, open contact. But they were technically on the same side. But a big reason for a lot of these hostilities was just, like, misunderstanding and miscommunication, because the Irish Defence Force uniforms looked, like, exactly the same as Belgian officer uniforms, which the Balubas were not fans of. On November 8th, 1960, 
a patrol being led by Lieutenant Kevin Gleason and Sergeant Hugh Gaynor, and consisting of nine other Irish Defence Force troops, came across a damaged bridge over the river Luayeye. They were ambushed by Balubas armed with bows and arrows. After their check-in was missed, the Irish back at their base camp became worried, but they were un- unable to launch a search for the patrol, as the patrol had taken the only vehicle that they had. Oh, so God's yeah, and it's like night time at this stage. So they're oh, like, fuck. we'd go searching for these guys, but they took our only car. We can't go looking for them. A uh, truck, I assume. There was like what eleven guys in this truck. Support vehicles arrived a few hours later, and they then launched a search to find these this missing patrol. Uh, they found the ambush site, and the bodies had all been mutilated. Now, like, I couldn't find exactly what had happened to the bodies, but they'd been mutilated to some degree. How many dead? Um, ten. Ten Irish. Ten Irish. Yeah. The, the only survivor was a man called Joe Fitzpatrick. Fitzpatrick was called a coward all his life for uh, being the only man to survive. They said that he ran. Yeah. Oh, man. It's like at the end of this, people were massive cunts. The movie doesn't really touch on it as much as I would have liked. But that was such a thing in Ireland, though, because yeah. like even when... um, Sorry, this is actually going back a, a good few years, but... um. So you got to put on your education again. I am. Here I go. She's um, going to use her fancy degree to tell us all what really happened. <laughs> But when um, World War One was started, uh, the Great War, sorry, when it was kicking off. Oh, the Great War, <laughs> la di da. But um, when the Great War was kicking off, um, even lads who were like, you know, against the Union with England, if they weren't heading over to help out the English with the war, like they weren't actually able to get married because girls would not marry them because Whoa. they were cowards. So like guys had to go if they wanted to. <laughs> Let if they that, wanted to fuck, they gotta get that go. Ass. <laughs> we'll definitely touch on that Irish ass. people in World War One and oh. World War Two as mm. well as some. It's really interesting. Um, your granddad was in World War Two, World War One. Great, great granddad. Right. My granddad was at the Blitz of London. Shit. Because he was in the air. <laughs> 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 no, he was. Uh, he had gotten tuberculosis. Die, British scum. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no, he had gotten tuberculosis and he was only like 19. Oh, fuck. I mean, you got TB in Ireland back then. They sent yeah. you over to England. And all they did was that they would bring you into this hospital and throw you out onto the balcony. And they'd leave you there because you're quarantined if you're on a balcony. So he was just out on a balcony with his TB during the Blitz of London. This guy, Joe Fitzpatrick, he was labelled yeah. a coward <laughs> by his fellow Irish Defence Force men and by people back home. And it took 47 years for him to receive a Medal of Honour for his service. Have you anything on the actual ambush? Because it's really fucked up. I've only, like, I've got this entire segment was all taken from the TG Carter documentary. So it's all kind of from the survivors. I think Joe, Joe Fitzpatrick is in the documentary and he tells oh, about really? what happens. And yeah. he's like, he, he's so good. He has like this mad, like, thick Dublin accent. And he's like, and then I can't do a Dublin accent. I'm from Dublin. He's like, um, you already have one. <laughs> these, he's like, these bluebirds popped up out from behind the trees, armed with oh, just talk normal bows and arrows. <laughs> you have a Dublin accent. I know, accent. I know, I know. He's like, these guys popped up armed with bows and arrows, and they all just started firing. And one of his men was like, "Run, run!" And they all tried to run, and he got into the trees and got away. I know that like the guy in the front was like trying to talk to the tribe people, and then they just started shooting them with arrows. And loads of them were beaten to death. Oh, fuck. like they weren't like like a few of the guys had guns, I think, in the tribe, but like the majority of them were just yeah yeah killed by bow and arrows. I think they killed a lot of the tribe's people, but I they, think so. Uh, they, they inflicted way heavier losses on them than they did yeah, themselves. But then they probably ran out of ammo or couldn't reload. Just overwhelmed. Enough. Yeah, I suppose. I think they killed thirty. Yeah, Don't I heard. I heard. That. I heard over thirty were, of them were killed. But ten of these guys were killed, and Joe Fitzpatrick was the only survivor. Um, this other guy back at the base, so he was in the same battalion, but wasn't involved in the ambush. His name was Michael Colton. Huh? And while he was... Colton. Holy <laughs> shit! <laughs> Sorry. Um, it all makes sense. <laughs> what, was <he> doing? <laughs> what was he doing back in the base? Making, Making... mobile phones. Oh, shit. But um, so while he was in the Congo, his son back home died. And uh, the Irish Defence Forces wouldn't pay for his flight home. Oh. And his family couldn't afford it. Him and his wife couldn't afford to fly him back home. So he had to accompany those bodies from that Baluba ambush back home in the same plane. And he, there's a quote from him in this documentary as well. It's pretty horrible. He's like, the smell is like, oh, God. he'll never forget it. Like, these guys have been dead for 
days before this plane had even arrived to take them back home. And there's a few hours, like that's hours and on the plane. She, yeah, yeah, God. Oh, oh like God. for them to get to the Congo was 24 hours from. And Ireland. this is like a car- uh, like a cargo plane, I mm. imagine. So he's like underneath where there's a few no stop air conditioning and stuff. And air- yeah, oh, yeah. Fuck that. So really fucked up there. So nobody really cares about the Irish, is what I'm hearing. Yeah, the Irish really hate we the Irish. We got shafted. After that ambush, the Irish troops in the Congo were outfitted with more modern Swedish FN rifles. Oh, yeah. You know all about FN rifles, I assume. Oh, what yeah. What ones are those? Funds, as FN we call Fals. them. Oh, Battle Fals. rifles. My favorite weapon in Modern Warfare 1. God, for uh, Belgian made, actually. Oh, God. <laughs> FN is. Oh, that's, didn't think that's about ironic. That. But, uh, what caliber, Luke? A three oh eight. Wow. They're uh, Didn't even take them a second. pretty useless on full auto, but uh, semi-auto, they're okay. I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind having one. It's the ones that the uh, British, uh, British Army pretty much had the same gun in the Bloody Sunday, which killed all the protesters. It was known as the right hand of the free world. Actually. Yikes! Wow, was the name of the, the given to the right. Sounds like America named that gun. Mm. We're three pages in, and like over an hour, and I finally arrived at the title of this episode of the podcast: the Siege of Jettoville. <laughs> the Irish 35th Battalion, unofficially known as A Company, under Commandant Pat Quinlan, who was played by Jamie Dornan in the lovely, movie. Lovely, mm, lovely Jamie Dornan. Lovely, Dorn. lovely stash on that man. <laughs> and that lovely Kerry accent as well. Ooh. 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 Oh, no. um, <laughs> and I saw some pictures of Pat Quinlan as well. You know, he, he's not too far off. The... Um, I mean, he's Was no, he a lovely looking boy? He's no Jamie Dornan. But, but he's a lovely looking boy. He's, he's alright. He looks about... He, looks he probably had a bit of road frontage too if he was from Kerry. What's that? What does that mean? Oh God. <laughs> we're, we're, city boys. We're, we're not culties. We <laughs> it's a big thing down the down in the country that if you're uh if you're no so Wait, what was the nope. phrase i didn't catch it road frontage road so it just means I that it, I does it mean hairy it bollocks no it means that your father owns land and when he dies you're going to inherit land that's bordering a road so if you're bordering a road it's 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 worth more because you 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 can more easily yeah. get to it. Oh, wow! So it just means you've inherited so good land. So it's more desirable to the ladies. Oh, it's a joke. It's like, a joke. This, it this is how we pick up. Not. This is how we pick up women in Ireland. We're like, me owns land, and she's like. Ooh. But that's like, a, like, like it's a quite common joke that if you're out and you're like you know your mates after shift and someone you're like ah yeah. Does he have does he have road frontage? Wow. Yeah, you're like, that boy's got massive road frontage. <laughs> and and a very reasonable size penis. <laughs> Six inches, not bad. <laughs> I saw hey, a picture. <laughs> I saw a picture of his house, full frontal road coverage. I never that. wanted to see that. I humped the mic stand. <laughs> No. You'll hear that that thumping in the audio. Just squeaking along the wood. (laughs) Um, Just loop it. So A Company under Commandant Pat Quinlan were dispatched to the small mining town of Jadoville to protect the local Belgian citizens. A Company arrived just as C Company and a detachment of Swedes. A Company arrived just as C Company? Like they upgraded it? I'm so confused. What? (laughs) (laughs) Can I finish the sentence? It was halfway through the sentence. Nah. (laughs) <laughs> so they arrived a bit after C Company oh. and also a detachment of Swedish peacekeepers yeah, yeah. were pulled out of Jadoville due to hostility from the locals. So they, uh, the so they sent the Irish in? Well, some Irish were already there, C Company. Right. As well as some Swedes before but them But these were well. the A's. These were the A Company, the OG. Uh, these boys so. knew what the fuck was up. Oh, They'd yeah. never been... Now, these C Company guys, <laughs> we'll come back to them later. Some of those guys were involved in a little tunnel-related incident oh, down no. the line. The number of men in Jadoville was reduced from about 300 to 155 as the other companies pulled out and A Company was sent in. A Company were treated pretty coldly by the locals. When you say the locals, you mean the Belgians? The Belgian locals, yeah. Right. They, did, they didn't want protection. from. Fuck the those guys. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't belong there either. <laughs> well, in the movie, they realize that they don't have enough provisions in this outpost that they've been given. Mm. So they go to the town to get food and they meet this Belgian woman who appears later in the movie and... She's like, oh, the really fancy. Yeah, yeah. Lady. She's like, I don't know if you realize, but you're not welcome here. And he's like, okay. And he's like, I'm gonna go down to the bar. And she's like, you don't want to go down to that bar because everyone fucking hates your guts mm-hmm. down at that bar. So he goes down anyway. And he was sitting in the bar, but fucking Rene Falke, who mm-hmm. is the leader of the mercenary force. Hey, Nikki, can you talk a bit there? Oh no. Yeah, shit. Oh, that's okay. Nikki hasn't said anything good for the last hour <laughs> and a half. 
So, uh, yeah, in Good the movie, home. Quinlan <laughs> shares a few glasses of cognac with the leader of the mercenary force in Jadotville, René Falke. And Falke mocks Quinlan for his men being battle virgins that they've never seen mm. in combat before. Does this actually happen? Or is this... No, this, this, is, this movie. is very likely. This also. is setting up the, the bad guy. Best access to Jadotville was the Lufira Bridge over Lufira River. The Irish were uh, low on... Per- is this per- the same bridge that the Bluebas are... The no, it's a Wales. very different bridge. Oh, different, a different, different part. Um, Other side of the country. I didn't listen to the first part. I was getting my alcohol. So yeah, the, the best access to the, <laughs> oh, my, oh, the town is over this one bridge, which comes into play later. The Irish were immediately low on provisions and proper weapons. They had um, a couple of Vickers machine guns and a few mortars. They have a great scene in the movie. Sorry, Luke, I'm bringing up the movie. But they have a great scene in the movie where they literally get all of their ammo together and they just start counting it and they're like... Ooh. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, all, all of their ammo good. together. Like, there, there's get two, the two bullets and like, there, there's a bit. The, <laughs> We're gonna have to get a lot of headshots. <laughs> there's, a, there's a bit in the movie where like the second in command grabs one of the UN issue blue helmets and taps it, and he's like, plastic, fucking useless, and just throws it down, and they just don't wear helmets for the whole rest of the movie. And if you see pictures of these guys in real life, none of them have helmets, so maybe that was true. So yeah, they have a couple of water cooled Vickers guns. Do you know anything about Vickers machine guns? Oh, oh super old. I feel like that's a World War one or oh shit! Three. Yeah, I mean the the Vickers machine gun was was a world war, was the World War Two machine gun. You know oh, the one that you look at looks like a like a kind of circular, yeah, yeah, yeah. like yeah. A, a medium machine gun. But I I I I I, I was kind of confused there because I know that they didn't shoot that, that gun shoots the British cartridge right and the FN file shoots a 308 so you couldn't even use the same ammo for the rifles. Well, they run mm. out Which of the, really uh, annoying. They run out of the Vickers gun ammo yeah. towards the end. Yeah, they had a couple of Vickers guns, mortars, and a couple of vehicles. Uh, Quinlan ordered his men to dig trenches around their position due to uh, general lack of cover. And in the movie, it's kind of because he knows that there's a strong military or a mercenary presence. But mm-hmm. I don't know if he knows about the mercenaries. So in imagine reality. how pissed off he gets on digging before the mercenaries. He just looks at it and says, "This place is shit." Yeah, yeah digs some, digs some trenches. Yeah, like. imagine arriving and, and I he and your and your yeah commanding officer dig trenches. Like, dig some trenches. Like, oh, fuck off. Like, yeah. And you're probably thinking that you're absolutely fine there. You're like, there's no one here. Yeah. Why am I digging a hole? They didn't think that they were going to be seeing combat. And this lad, in, just from what I remember from the movie, Jamie Dornan hasn't been in battle either, and everything yeah. he knows is like from books, and like people keep bringing that up, and they're like you've just fucking read this. And he's like, no, no, we need to fortify. <laughs> and everyone's like, fuck. Yeah, off. I thought that was, it was kind of corny, but kind of an arc for his character because he learns to let go of the books and embrace his own skills mm. as a commander. Like at the beginning, he's like, get some men on the south flank. And they're like, but they're only attacking from the north, sir. And he's like, do what I say. And they all get there and they're like, there's no one coming. Let's fuck this. Let's go back to the north. And like, he literally swipes all his books off his bed and shouts, fuck. Yeah. Because his books have failed him. Like, <laughs> I don't know. What's it going to be like? How, how to hold, uh, how to hold the south flank. <laughs> <laughs> I've only learned about the south flank. I thought that was a weird I one in the movie. didn't get to the second half of the book. <laughs> I thought that was oh, a weird no. one in the movie anyway. Like, I don't know what the real life situation was, but the movie's like, we outnumber out you like 20 to 1, mm. but we're only going to attack from one flank. <laughs> Like how to how to defend Shadowville one oh one. It's like this book is shit. <laughs> I'm never gonna need this. It's so flank. Well they, they were all coming the only the best way in was through that one bridge over that river, so they would have had to come from that one side unless they went like way around. Yeah, the yeah. yeah but bridge well, over the river. Why not do that? Hmm? Why not do that? Well they do towards the end. Yeah, right? Yeah. Just for the climax. Uh, on Wednesday the thirteenth of September nineteen sixty one, which if you remember from two hours ago was the and day if you that remember op- it's a month before my birthday okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, where's your birthday it was it's of October it was did you ever clean someone's kitchen <laughs> <laughs> I'm my <lap. laughs> I don't know all these in jokes <laughs> and all I cleaned <laughs> Luke's kitchen and she, she hasn't, hasn't showed up about about it. for a month now a full a month. month now. That's kind of impressive seeing as how it happened two weeks ago. <laughs> I, yeah, Wednesday the 13th of September 1961 was the day that Operation Morthor officially began. in Morthor. <laughs> and that morning, A Company in Jadoville were attending a mass. Which company? A Company. No, which, which one? Which one? <laughs> the letter A Company. <laughs> <laughs> the letter A. 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 Quid B. Quid Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so it was an open air mass but in the film they're in like a church but it was an open air mass uh, a convoy of three trucks carrying Katangi's forces approached Jadaville and they were spotted by the only man not attending the mass who tried to war- warn the rest of the men 
to no avail. And in the film, he uses his rifle to like shoot the church bell mm. to alert him. In the T.G. Carter documentary, they say that he ran to a gun nest and just opened fire on the trucks, and that's what alerted them. Okay. And I think that sounds way more badass than him being like, Ugh, how do I alert the guys? And he shoots a bell and sits there and waits for them all to show I up. mean, I feel like first response all the time if some lads are coming in to fucking kill you is shoot to them. shoot at them, yeah. not so the bell. He hops on a machine gun nest and kicks ass. So yeah, <laughs> a, co- a company quickly abandoned the mass. They armed themselves and Which they... <laughs> for fuck's sake. <laughs> and, and they, they get into their trenches um, they inflict heavy casualties on the first wave of Katangi's forces until they retreat and a jet flies over their position and drops two bombs I have the name of the jet here somewhere some model of the jet Harry <laughs> Harry <laughs> <laughs> the name of the jet fuck's sake that's so bad. it was a <laughs> Fuga Magister jet. Oh, okay. I don't know what type of jet that is. My uncle flew a Fuga. Really? Yeah, they Shut just... up. Your Fuga. uncle did everything. Was this the same they uncle? Was, they, they, that's what he was trained on. Wow. Uh, it does say that it Super is... Super old. It was a... Tra- same. It was used as a training jet. <laughs> yeah. So a really banged up training jet. But they, he drops a couple of bombs on the Irish position anyway. So um, basically... This siege lasts for five days, and throughout the five days, the Tangi's forces attack in waves. Five days? Five days. And they still didn't get back up? Five no, days? No, they didn't. Five days? They request for backup. Jesus. And in the movie, it's like Pat Quinlan, not Pat Quinlan, but he, um, Connor O'Brien is on the phone and he's like, you're not getting any reinforcements, Quinlan. You're just going to stay there and sort it yeah. out yourself. Like, I really doubt that happens. Five days, Jesus Five Christ. days, yeah. Well, so, I mean, to be fair, where would the reinforcements even have been coming from? Well, I wouldn't hope there would be reinforcements. reinforcements. I hope there would be reinforcements. <laughs> we can come. We can come. I would have thought more of a, an evacuation rather than a reinforcement. Like, let's get yeah. you guys out of there. I mean, their, tr- their yeah. whole mission is to, pr- is to protect the town. So you want more people to reinforce those guys and protect the town. I mean, you think by like, what, day three, mm. where they're like, fuck, we're running out of ammo. We can't do this, this anymore. They're probably running out of food. This wasn't in the film, but this is some bollocks here. I'll get to it now in a sec. So the Katangi's numbers vary from 3,000 to 5,000. pro Katangi's Lubas, as well as Belgian, French and Rhodesian mercenaries against 155 Irishmen. And That's how, how much we're in the quid a. Quid a, where it's 155. Mm-hmm. The Katangi's forces were supported by mortar units, a 75mm field artillery gun, and the aforementioned Fuga Magister jet. They didn't have the 75mm gun in this no, movie. No, they, they should have. That would have been cool. Um, it wasn't in the budget. <laughs> so after the first day of attacks, Maybe. electricity and water was cut to Jadoville. And a company filled every container they could with water, including they had uh, basically been loaned a couple of villas in the town from locals to use. And uh, they filled all the bathtubs in these villas with water to use for drinking water. Smart move. But uh, one guy decided to take a bath in one of the baths and ruined wow. the whole spot. Guys! Of yeah. It doesn't say if he was an Irish man or one of the local Belgians, but uh, he decided to take a bath in their drinking water. So, I, I mean, you would have drank it anyway, right? Well, I would have yeah. saved it for uh, last. Testicle tea. I would have saved that bath <laughs> for last. Jesus. Out of all the bath <laughs> Except to be the one lad who wants to drink it now. And you're like, <laughs> he's like, I'll take one for the team, sir. It's like, we, we've still got, we've still got ten ba- normal bathtubs left. Like, oh no, 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 no. don't you? No, I'm grand with this one here, sir. And, and it's, and it's for, the, the, for the comrades. And it's the company <laughs> chaplain as well. Oh god. Do you want us to boil the water for you? It's like, oh, oh no, no, I wouldn't no, want you to do that effort. You just wouldn't mind going off now and man in those trenches i'll just have a sip here now it's gonna <laughs> lap it up here looks like looks like the water's gotten a bit milky since we've been gone <laughs> oh, oh my no. god oh. <laughs> sorry um, <laughs> uh, on the second day after again driving back to katangi's forces a ceasefire was called and they discussed terms of the ceasefire um basically the pro katangi's forces just want to collect bodies mm. and quinlan agrees so immediately after the last of the dead were collected by the pro-Katangi's forces. The ceasefire was broken and they launched a surprise assault on the Irish position, including intensive mortar strikes. And like the guys in the documentary Scummy bastards. are pretty pissed about this. Yeah. They're like, this goes against the Geneva Convention and it goes against every... Mortar like, strikes? Well, no, attacking... Breaking the ceasefire. Oh, oh, of course. Yeah, yeah sorry. 
And, um, yeah, in the movie, they, they get it, so they have medic trucks. Yeah, they, they drive and ambulances and they just Some people sno- and... sneak out of the bottom of the medic truck and set up mortars. Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. It's, yeah. Uh, it's a good movie, though. Um, look. This is a movie I'm review. I'm willing to sacrifice <laughs> a bit of historical accuracy to make the movie better. It's not a documentary, you know what I mean? Yeah. So they've broken the ceasefire, another day of fighting commences. And they're being fired on from a mortar position, but the Irish mortar unit is more accurate and actually takes out the mortar line of the pro Katangi's forces. Pretty fucking hardcore. And it's a really cool scene in the movie as well. Like, they've got, like, truck-mounted mortar teams behind the tree line, and they're, like, seeing where the shots are coming from, and they, like, zero in. They just, like, fire their whole line of mortars and just... They blow up the ammo depot of mortar shells, and it takes yeah. out, like, all the trucks, and there's this, You see like, the big explosion behind explosion. the trees. Like, it's pretty cool. And they're like, that's the mortars, we got them. Woo! Uh, throughout the week, the Irish were calling for supplies and reinforcements. And although initially de- denied reinforcements, a detachment of troops, they'd sent 30 troops in the film, I think it was a bit more than that in reality, were sent to relieve the Irish, mostly consisting of Indian UN peacekeepers. But the Katangis had closed off the Lufira Bridge and dug in, and they were stopping the reinforcements from crossing the bridge and helping out the Irish. And uh, at one point, the UN was able to airdrop a supply of water to the Irish, the water had been stored in hastily emptied petrol containers oh, that hadn't been cleaned, oh, oh, rendering Jesus. the water undrinkable. What the fuck? So they drop off a supply of water. That's actually that's true. Undrink- that's uh, true. That wasn't what even in the film. What the fuck? They just want these guys to they die. They really want them to die. <laughs> they don't give a fuck. In the film, a helicopter arrives and drops off supplies and collects wounded, but it's like shot down. I don't think that happened. And we, then they run away from the blades. The yeah, and, crashes, it stops and the blades ages. are still it's spinning. Like the and possible. they're like, run! <laughs> oh, no. yeah, yeah, Are you saying that didn't happen? Uh, at first, Quinn's like, no, stay back, it's too dangerous. And then one of the guys falls like 50 feet out of the helicopter. And oh, yeah, back and I and he's like, fell. Get him! And they grab him and they're dragging him away as the helicopter crashes and the blades oh. nearly chop him up. And then it's, it's like, now go get the pilots. Yeah, the pilots. <laughs> he says that in the movie. Yeah, so Always. The, pilot, the numbers didn't increase, so they didn't rescue any pilots. I assumed that there was no helicopter in reality. But uh, that that water thing did happen, and that's just sad. That's that's ridiculous. That's like something I'd do if I was in charge of delivering water. To see <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, well, all we've got are these petrol canisters. Empty them out, fill them with water. Uh, the jet made another few runs at the Irish over the next couple of days. It was out of bombs, so it was firing on them with machine guns. Was the scene where the second in command dude was running from it, and it was flying in behind them and, and strafed, the but the bullets went beside him? I don't think that happened. No? That's some bullshit. Kelly, you don't know for sure. I don't know for sure. I can't say yes or no, but definitely no. Okay. That's ridiculous. Put it down Um, as a probably. The the Irish (laughs) fired back with their Vickers guns and eventually drove the plane back. And that's pretty cool in the movie. So Quinlan gets on a truck mounted Vickers gun and all his lads lift it up and push it onto its side so that he's pointing up at the sky. Yeah. Surely you can just... (laughs) <laughs> yeah i would have thought but probably flip me over lads and they're like no, one more time <laughs> <laughs> sir you'll be crushed <laughs> keep flip on flipping that's it, a direct fucking order <laughs> they flip them all the way back to ireland just rolling the truck up <laughs> <laughs> but the, the second the, the guys are like the gunners are like should we tell him that the gun has a hinge on it and they're like no no just let him have this one Flip his the books truck didn't over. tell him it, God bless it was a cool him. shot it looked cool in the movie after five days the Irish were low on ammo and provisions and a man from the Katangi's side arrived into their lines to inform them that they were being taken prisoner wait hold on did you did, did you say that they surrendered or they're being taken prisoner by who? Like you, see, you made it sound like some guy, like after five days, someone just walked up and said, "You're now prisoners." Give yeah, them. I mean they have to surrender. They do surrender. What's he gonna do? In the documentary, they say that the guys were like hold up, and they see Quinlan walking through their ranks with this guy from the opposite side mm-hmm. discussing terms of surrender. So some guy came over to their side to check out their position and accept their terms of surrender, kind of thing. And informed them that they were going to be taken prisoner. Because like, they could have just been like, we're going to overrun you and fuck you up. Because nobody would have known either, right? Like, yeah. And, and, the, no and one... the Irish are after ki- killing so many oh, fucking men you know mean, at, right? at this stage. Yeah. Um, I mean, massacres in history have happened in much lesser, you know, yeah. circumstances. Um, Any reason why? Why not? I don't know. Maybe it was bad press to kill the UN people. They could have used them as chips to uh, trade for... Maybe the mercenaries were prisoners. running out of ammo too. The, the UN had uh, Katangi's prisoners. Maybe they wanted to trade the Irish yeah. for them kind of thing. Yeah. It's a lot of foresight to have when you're taking these guys hostage who've been killing oh, your yeah. guys for like, five days. As far right? as if you're one of these mercenaries or one of these uh, Baluba guys who like are You fucking hate them. Yeah, you're like, 
we've been assaulting these guys for five days straight and they're just mowing us down like it's nothing like yeah, yeah. the katangi's men searched the town and were amazed to find that not a single irishman had been killed in all, in all those five days the irish had only suffered five casualties but had inflicted over 300 kills and as many as 1,000 casualties on the Katangi's forces. Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. So um, five, five people, were, five injured. people were injured. Not dead. Not dead. It was just like the lad who fell out the helicopter. Oh, well, Except there was no helicopter. In, in the movie, the main dude was shot in the shoulder, but it's never brought up. I don't think yeah, I was wondering, like, is that just yeah, drama? He's, he's full on shot in the shoulder and they're like, what was it like to get shot, sir? And he's like, I wouldn't recommend it. And, and then he's, he's fine like, the next day. He's fine. That didn't happen. He's back that fighting. <laughs> um, yeah, so they've suffered five injuries and inflicted 300 kills on the enemy. That's mad. So the Irish were held captive for a total of six weeks under penalty of death. So they were basically being told, like, you're going to die at some point here. And they were constantly being transferred from prison camp to prison camp as negotiation attempts were made by the UN and were subsequently broken down. So they're like, all right, you're getting released, guys. And they'd drive them and then they'd be like, no, you're getting taken to another prison yeah. camp. And this has been going on for six weeks. And during one transfer, uh, some of the Irish men had a plan to subdue the guards and the driver and hijack the bus and use it to ram a roadblock and make their escape. But it turned out that this was the transfer attempt that ended up being successful and they were traded for a number of Tangy's <laughs> prisoners. So like if, if they turned so the bus... That would have been awkward timing, right? Yeah, if they turned the bus around, they would have killed the driver and stolen the bus. But it turned out that they didn't need to in the end. No, you imagine like they're literally about to get to like the handover they're place. Like, they're like they, holding a shiv up to kill, the driver. They kill the driver and drive through this roadblock, and it's like we're making our escape. Yeah, it's, it's just their roadblock. in the UN headquarters, and like, oh, Uh-oh. oh shit, <laughs> not again. <laughs> so they're now free. On returning to Ireland, a company was met with a general Which company. <laughs> oh, for fuck's sake, a general uh, <laughs> uh, era, aura of coldness and sometimes open hatred for surrendering they were it labeled... was awful at the end of the movie like i felt that, nah. that's nothing Fucked compared to what was I like know. when they got home everyone so was just like meh they were fucky anyway <laughs> back in ireland they were labeled the jadoville jacks and they when they were returning for work when some of the men returned for work with the irish defense forces that they never mentioned that they had been the ones who had been stationed in jadoville in order to avoid mockery and to be able to keep their positions. So they were like, if we have to get work in the Irish army again, we can't mention that we were the ones in Jadoville. That's insane. Because we'll be treated as cowards. Like, they were treated as scum when they got back to Ireland for years. In the movie, it has, like, oh, like a real patriotic <laughs> bullshit ending. Like, oh, they all salute him. <laughs> yeah, he goes up to O'Brien and the general, and, like, the general's like, no one could know about this. In fact, it's only my decision that's keeping you from being court-martialed for cowardice. And he's like, do it then, I don't care. And he's like, I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about your man. And then Quinlan just decks him to the ground. Was that true? No. Damn. <laughs> and the guy walks up to O'Brien and he's like, oh, he owed me that one. And then he goes up to his own man and they all salute him and he starts crying and it's all this big thing. And he's like, okay, at ease, man. And they don't go at ease. They still yeah, salute yeah, yeah. him. He, he lowers his hand at ease, but the rest of them keep their hand. And he's like, well, now under army law, you guys have to stay like that forever because you, can't, <laughs> you have to stand at attention until you're told not to. He didn't follow the orders. The right order. <laughs> <laughs> so those guys are still standing in that airfield oh, to this day. Skeletons. <laughs> yeah, they're still saluting. <laughs> the uh, siege of Shadowville was not recognized by the UN as having even occurred for years. That's and m- what was it? They were, what? They, were, were of cons. they were treated as cowards for surrendering in the line of duty by fellow Irish Defence Force men and yeah, just generally mocked for the rest of their careers and a lot of them never saw retribution. A lot of them died before they were ever recognised. So yeah, that was the Siege of Jadaville, which I'm amazed that we're not that I've never heard about it until this week. Like mm. it's incredible. It's yeah. really it's amazing. Like these guys had never seen battle before and their very first taste of combat, they like suffer zero casualties and inflict 300 kills on the enemy so um it, it seems like only a second has passed due to the magic of editing but in fact we're just back from a five minute tea break during which time i wrote another script and edited the last three hours of audio that we recorded and That's i went so to see a psycho for five minutes yeah psycho what the first one the movie in the cinema it's pretty good in nikki nikki yeah. is nikki is also it? dead uh, oh nice gg nikki he's dead oh yeah nikki left he had to go home. Maybe Nikki heard enough of the siege of Jadoville and decided to skip. Yeah. yeah. I think we can come to the conclusion that Nikki is a massive racist. 
Is there anybody to uh, refute those claims? Remember that time claims? that we uh, turned off so, the microphone for an entire hour and no one noticed? <laughs> do, do you actually, do you just want to wrap up the Siege of Shadowville? Because I had this whole other thing about the Battle of the Tunnel, but we could do that another day as a separate thing. Because it's yeah, kind of like two good. separate incidents. So will I just wrap it up? I, um, I just have some quick little things that we were talking about last week that I thought could do a bit more explanation. So like, you're... I'm sorry, what was that? What? Sorry. <laughs> Um, what? Sorry, his voice broke, and I thought it was. Oh yeah. Funny. Oh man, I can't stand. <laughs> my own voice. <laughs> I, I so when I sent Eva the demo of the first episode, it's I sent, happening again. I sent her. There's like a minute long compilation of squeaky voice teen on The Simpsons, and I sent it along. With, I hate my voice whenever I'm listening. Back I hate on my this. voice when I hear my voice as well. That's why I haven't listened to the podcast. Oh, yeah, we all hate your voice too. So they're pretty like heavily edited and a lot of that is just cutting out dead air and you know people doing shit and like tangents and really racist stuff and a lot of them is cutting out me but a lot no, of no no we kept you in but we put one of those like Darth Vader voices <laughs> <laughs> so rude but um I, I cut out so many like uh and like mm, for me or that I, I, I hate my own voice I cut out like weird noises you cut out your likes I cut out a lot of likes, yeah. Because you got a lot of likes in your kitty. Yeah, I know. Can we get some likes on this episode as well? <laughs> smash that like button. <laughs> like, only. subscribe, and smash that notification bell. No, um, it's smash that like button. They're all about that bell yeah, as well. Smash that like button. And make sure to visit my Patreon at www.alewantsmoneyforcheckers.com I'm going to smash the URL. <laughs> you dumbass. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> is that real? Oh, oh okay. Boo, this conversation. Boo. Are you saying Just boo give me or money. booers? Quiet, Vader. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, actually, I'm going to totally no. put that effect on her voice for this whole episode. No. It's a no! Halloween edition. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, yeah. Well, the, since I'm just wrapping up the, con- the Siege of Jadaville thing, I. I did some extra research into shit that you were asking about last week that I didn't know about. So the first thing was the Colton that you were mad for the fucking yeah. Colton. So there's like I um, forgot about that. Uh, there's this material called tantalum that's extracted from the same mineral that Colton is found in, and that's used to create uh, capacitors. Um, I I came across some sources that were saying that the American and USSR interest in the Congo was for missile targeting systems so i assume they needed a shitload of tantalum capacitors so for these i was systems. so fucking on the money you with my colton my facts so, and you um, bitches tried to tell me colton wasn't real uh, <laughs> well, here we are basically since colonization did, uh, did we get any do we any clarification on the magical bean situation uh i'm afraid there are no magical beans thing. after all uh, <laughs> well Listen, there is a f- what? the official <laughs> statement from the UN is that there's no magical yeah, beans, yeah. but we all know it's a conspiracy. Whoa, low, low. Whoa, low, low. <laughs> Whoa, low, low. Whoa, low. So, yeah, since colonization, the Congo has had a long history of human rights abuses to do with these mines, including the uses of tens of thousands of child miners. And if Nikki was here, he would say, but aren't children already miners? <laughs> to which I would say, fuck you, Nikki. I'm trying to fucking read this script. And that's why he's not here this week. And then we, we turned off his mic this. for at least half an hour. Yeah, Nikki's here, out. but we've just turned his mic off. You can't tell. Hey, Nikki, what do you think about child miners? <laughs> um, so there's, there's, there's loads of places where you can legally acquire Colton, but um, a sp- specifically China is known for like smuggling Colton legally out of the Congo. Probably cheaper, I guess. True, like... Rwanda and other places. China smuggles a lot of stuff. Here's the most interesting Colton fact I could come across. Yay! Um, in the in 2000, the production of the PlayStation 2 caused a spike in the price of Colton due to lack of demand or due to over demand, mm. uh, which led to bouts of like violence and uprisings in Eastern Congo. So people, presumably many of which were child miners yeah. or minor miners. Uh, were killed. Due minor miners. Minor miners. <laughs> oh, no. Were killed because of the PlayStation 2, which yeah. I feel bad for owning two PlayStation 2s. Guys, you gotta know where your shit's coming from. So, yeah, we were, we were talking about um, what America's deal was in the Congo. Um, apparently, America and Soviet Union's interests were sort of... They were on the same page when it came Colton. to the Congo. They both wanted Belgium to withdraw their forces from the Congo. And America was actually... Uh, they influenced the UN in stepping up 
ground forces in the Congo. So even though they weren't necessarily American peacekeeper troops on the ground, the Americans were the ones sort of telling the UN to send in the Irish and Indian and Swedish UN troops that they did end up sending in. It's good on you, America. You had another uh, civil war you had nothing to do with, and you went in and fucked it up anyway. Cheers. They'll learn their lesson. There Someday. won't be another one. <laughs> I hear they're going for Iran next, actually. That's going to be the next big one. Yeah, I hear there's something going on in Vietnam at the moment that they might be looking into. Mr. Trump, you're reading a history book. <laughs> What? Hey, why are you... This guy Ho Chi Minh, we need to do something about him. They're bringing rapists, they're bringing murderers. They're not sending their best people, let me tell you. <laughs> I think we should all go to Vietnam and walk the Ho Chi Minh Trail. That'd be class. That would be really you get, you get infections and stuff from mosquitoes. No, but Uncle Ho will be walking with you. Uncle Ho. There's a band that Eva loves. I think they're called um, Spies, they're Irish. The Minch. Who's Ho Chi Minh? Yeah. The lad. The man, the myth, Is that the like legend. the guy from The Big Lebowski? Yeah. <laughs> Jeff Bridges fucking started the Vietnam War. But before he was in The Big Lebowski, <laughs> was like, he was the leader of Vietnam. It's like, you can't be communist. That's just like uh, your opinion, your opinion man. man. <laughs> <laughs> this is a civil war, America. That's just like your opinion, man. Send them in, boys. <laughs> Your man, uh, the Prime Minister Patrice Lumumba, who was sent to Elizabethville and executed, uh, Belgium officially apologised in 2002 for his assassination, so they were in cahoots with the Katangis there. But uh, the CIA is also heavily suspected, but they remain, they maintain that they had nothing to do with it. They maintain that they don't exist. <laughs> yeah, the CIA refused to comment and said that they don't in fact exist. <laughs> Stop sending them letters. <laughs> um, the stamp CIA. <laughs> uh, when we were saying in what way did they surrender a ceasefire was called and then a guy from the katangi's forces came over and negotiated surrender with quinlan because uh in the movie it's like they show from across the battlefield you know, and shake hands and whatever but in real life this, that was during a ceasefire whereas in the movie they literally are being bombarded by shells and the smoke is just clearing when the guy's like you want to surrender and they're like yeah so that's the way that went down i wouldn't mind it I, sure <laughs> sure check it have you got water that isn't full of petrol <laughs> And I've been then, telling so many people about that fact that like event like when they finally convinced the EU to send over something, they sent them fucking petrol water. The EU. Yeah, the fucking EU. Oh, you see, your man was on the radio and he was like, "We need petrol and water," and they heard, "We need petrol <laughs> water." <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, the EU is on the way. It's like Belgium have volunteered to see. Yeah, water. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a round of applause for Belgium. <laughs> Thank you, Belgium. And that took two weeks of fucking negotiating as well. Should we send water? Nay. Who said that? (laughs) Belgium? (laughs) To you? (laughs) (laughs) And uh, the last thing. Yeah, basically, I just kind of... When I was listening back to the episode that we'd recorded so far, like I was kind of thinking maybe we were getting a bit too far into the territory of like... uh, What's it called when you like make something seem amazing or whatever Romantic, romanticizing yeah, to romanticize war something. i don't want to you know because i feel like a hypocrite because i'm always giving out about like propaganda movies like american sniper and shit like that yeah. for us to be like yeah go on you irish for winning that battle or whatever it, whereas, yeah but it's kind of hard not to because the lads do you know what they did they did good they did good in the face of adversity too because they had the the fucking un yeah <laughs> being dicks and the and eu yep yeah, yeah, thank yeah, too yeah, them too <laughs> And the CIA. <laughs> nah. nah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, from a, milit- from a pure strategy, a military point of view, they did good. But um, I'm, a bit, I'm quite proud of Ireland's neutrality and our stance on neutrality in all these conflicts. And I feel like we shouldn't have been there in the first place. We were thing. neutral. We were peacekeepers and they attacked the forces. That's why they were blue. Yeah, but I mean, like, all the, all the higher ups kind of <laughs> were expecting shit to kick off, you know? And they used the UN peacekeepers as a military to, like, take back territory from the Katangis forces and stuff. And I, I don't know, that's not what we're about. We're not about fighting wars for other people. Especially considering we were colonized at one point ourselves, you know, and we had a civil war ourselves. If the, what if the UN had sent in peacekeepers to, like, you know, they, deal with the troubles and stuff? The, the, the secessionists? Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, like... And I'm going to be honest here, we've romanticized the IRA quite a bit since we've started this podcast. Yeah, we really have. I should put a little disclaimer <laughs> at the end of that episode. Um, and I, we've uh, we've said some jokes at the expense of the British. I, I remember I said something quite They terrible. weren't jokes, those were facts. Those were facts. I was saying about your granddad or whatever, and you were like he was in the 
the, the Battle of Britain. Oh, Anthony yeah. Luke was like in the air. When he was uh, That's really funny. Yeah, it was TV. funny. But I'm just saying, you know, we don't hate the British. Or Whoa. I do. We don't love the IRA. Whoa. And so Operation Morthor did eventually lead. Morthor. There was like another two operations by the UN that eventually led to to Shambay surrendering on the 17th of January 1963. But it was kind of regarded as a bit of a failure because it got so out of hand and eventually led to like open warfare. And that thing that I'll bring back up again at another time, that battle of the tunnel, is um, it's like oh, it's like an actual war zone kind of thing situation. Um, so yeah, Shambay surrendered 17 January 1963, and he was charged with treason and fled the Congo to Spain. And he then returned and was placed under house arrest in the Congo until he died of a heart attack in 1969. So the men of the 35th and 36th battalions involved in the siege of Jadoville and the battle for the tunnel uh, were finally recognised by the Irish government in 2004. And a company were uh, awarded honorary scrolls and a memorial was erected in Athlone. 14 members of the 36th who were involved in the battle of the tunnel were given distinguished service medals and three of them were awarded those posthumously because three of them were actually killed in action. And in 2017, a plaque of Pat Quinlan was unveiled by Enda Kenny in County Kerry. And I saw, I read like the, I think it was an Independent or Irish Times article. I'm sorry, about did you that. say Pat Kenny? Enda Kenny. Enda Kenny. Pat Quinlan, uh, a plaque. <laughs> of, um, so yeah, yeah, it was like... Massive <laughs> 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 Yeah, yeah, all his family, all his family are there and they dropped the curtain. Pat <laughs> <laughs> Kenny. Patrick Quinlan. <laughs> <laughs> his like grandchildren are just bawling, crying like, oh, what happened? <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> but yeah like it's I mean <laughs> they're Irish so like they don't want to say that they're wrong they go oh, oh yeah, oh, yeah. It, you captured his likeness <laughs> very well there. but like I, I read the article about it's lovely <laughs> when they unveiled that plaque and it's like Andy Kenny with like the family of Pat Quinlan holding up the plaque and it's like a brass plaque and like I'm just so embarrassed because like Andy Kenny just really embarrasses me like do you ever hear him talk you remember Andy Kenny obviously like I have a like a little thing on my fridge at home with his signature on it. It looks like really? a dog. Did you actually meet him? I don't know where we got it. <laughs> it's like, I pray to it every night. Nice. Yeah. But like, just can you imagine him trying to honour like, like the only Irish war heroes we have really? He you couldn't know? even honour the postman. I mean, we don't honour like one of our greatest war heroes, Mr. Jerry Adams. <laughs> oh, Alleged war no. hero, Jerry Adams. <laughs> or Marty Marty McGuinness. Marty Mark, Marky Mark McGinnis. I think he got a few honourable mentions after his death. Yeah, that's true. Did you see the yeah, big f- Fuck off. No, mm-hmm. actually. For Mark McGinnis, it's really good. Yeah, well, that pretty much wraps up the Congo stuff. Um, what do you reckon? Like, what do you think their actual kind of like go ab- like mentality about it was? Like, even when they were there, so like they got sent as pe- peacekeepers. It must have been very kind of like morally ambiguous kind of for them just because like they got sent to protect people and suddenly they're like being presented with the issue of like maybe they might have to kill someone yeah and then they do like that must be like that must, and like you said they had never a lot of them had like never seen any bit of like combat well, before none of the people there had ever been in combat and C- before quinlan had seen he hadn't even gone away from ireland yet <laughs> i'd say they hadn't planned on shooting someone and then they got shot at. Yeah. So they shot them yeah. back. Yeah, yeah. yeah I don't think I'd have any trouble shooting at someone shooting at me. There's no, I don't think there's anything moral, n- well, any like, moral thoughts being put into it. If somebody starts shooting at you, you're probably going to try and shoot I them first before they get the bullet the f- into you. But you fault. probably joined the peacekeepers. Like, you, you, you're like, oh, I'm going to save people. No, you didn't, they, these lads joined the Irish army. They wanted to be soldiers. They didn't want to be peacekeepers. I mean, the peacekeeping missions since then have, all the UN missions have been pretty much a failure, right? Yeah. If you look at what happened in Rwanda and what happened in uh, in Yugoslavia, like I mean, they just completely failed the people. And like genocides happened under. I mean, you could argue they didn't have the the, the backup or did they the really fuck up <laughs> as badly in Yugoslavia? Yeah. The, like, the, what was that about? They let the you know, remember all the, the all the Muslim men got massacred like 2,000 of them okay. you should read it really read into it that. basically the, all the people were, were, were getting refuge in the UN base and the Serbs came and were like give us all your men all the men here and the UN people were like no and then they're like we'll just bomb the place and then they just kind of gave them all up and then they shot them up so this is kind of a pattern for the UN because we had that Radio Katanga massacre where they massacred all a couple yeah. hundred civilians in that radio station you should definitely look into the, uh, the genocide and that war. Good job, guys.
we made it through an episode of whatever this is and it needs to get a name by the end of the week I, what's trying. wrong with all I the names that we've name come up good. with already I, any name that anyone suggested i've looked up and it's already a podcast you irish identity one? that's already a podcast no it's not or it's what do you mean no it's not oh wait it's not a podcast but it's like a website oh it's called irishdensity.ie and it's like an irish um familial ancestry sort of thing so we can't take that and also it sounds lame it sounds kind of sound lame I was, yeah. trying to incorporate, I was trying to incorporate ta- cans into the name. So I looked up like... Cans and tans? Cans and tans. Cans and tans. That's actually not bad. Get out you cans and tans. <laughs> I looked up um, tails and tins because tinnies is another name for cans. And that's actually a podcast. That's a very English name for I know, cans. I know. In but I couldn't few, find anything A few tans. tinnies. Tinnies. Uh, but yeah, cans and tans. Although that implies... We're, we're very IRA black and tans focused. Same as we are the black and tans. Yeah. <laughs> the, the one like podcast in support. Like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Irish Historical Weekly. James, why do you want to make us sound like we're 70 year old men just talking about fucking, oh, I remember in my town in Wicklow, you know, one lad that came through once with a bushel of potatoes and we sold them for 50 cent <laughs> potato. And you know That's what? Expensive they were all potato. rotten. I know. <laughs> That's a great story. <laughs> Um, okay. you're, you're obsessed with the name. You're never gonna like all the names of, of the best podcasts are shit. My yeah. favorite murder is fucking class. No, it's not. It's my favorite murder. What my favorite is... Irish stories. Uh... My favorite murder is a terrible name for a podcast. Why is it a good name? It would be much easier if we could include Irish words in, but I know that nobody's He's ever gonna find it down. You yeah. can use the word Gaelic. No, that's offensive. Just choose a name and stick to it. Eventually, yeah. I think the name. We should just become... call us ourselves Cockamillish. What a movie. We should do a movie review of Cockamillish someday. <laughs> so good. Thank you for listening to the very first episode of Potato Related Issues. Once again, if you want to get in contact with us, you can find the details at the start of this episode or in the links below. Or you can just leave us a comment if you're watching this on YouTube. See you next time. Bye.